Hello, fourth graders, it's Miss Leanne. We are going to start our next lesson in our Historical Fiction Book Clubs unit. This is a two-part lesson, so we are going to do the first part of lesson six. In this lesson, we are going to be looking at some big ideas. We're going to hopefully be seeing some really big ideas, but they're, the author is going to show us these big ideas and some of the smaller details in our text. So that way, when we are reading, we really need to be paying attention, some real close attention to what's happening in the story. So sometimes when you read, there comes a part where you're like, hmm, Things are written in a different kind of way and it makes you kind of think a little bit more about what's happening. So I'm going to start um, reading to you some of chapter five to help us um, just kind of see what changes that makes us stop and think. So in the beginning, beginning of chapter five, it starts with, Anne Marie eased the bedroom door open quietly, only a crack and peeked out. Behind her, Ellen was sitting up, her eyes wide. She could see Mama and Papa in their no night clothes moving about. Mama held a, can a lighted candle, but as Anne Marie watched, she went to a lamp and switched it on. It was so long a time since they dared to use the strictly rationed electricity after dark that the light in the room seemed startling to Anne-Marie. Watching through the slightly opened bedroom door, she saw her mother look automatically to the blackout curtains, making certain that they were tightly drawn. Papa opened the door to soldiers. This is the, the, this is the Johansson apartment, a deep voice asked the question loudly in the terribly accented Danish. Our name is on the door and I see you have a flashlight, Papa answered. What do you want? Is something wrong? I understand you are a friend of your neighbors, the Rosens, Mrs. Johansson, the soldier said angrily. Sophie Rosen is my friend, that is true, Mama said quietly. Could you please speak more softly? My children are asleep. Then you will be so kind as to tell me where the Rosens are. He made no effort to lower his voice. I assume they are at home sleeping. It is four in the morning after all. Anne-Marie heard the soldier stalk across the living room toward the kitchen. From her hiding place in the narrow sliver of an open doorway, she could see the heavy uniformed man, a holstered pistol at his waist and the entrance to the kitchen, peering toward the sink. Another German voice, the Rosen's apartment is empty. We are wondering if they might be visiting their good friends, the Johansons. Well, said Papa, moving slightly so he was standing in front of Anne Marie's dark, Anne Marie's bedroom door. She could see nothing except the dark blur of his back. As you see, you are mistaken. There is no one here but my family. You will not object if we look around. The voice was harsh and it was not a question. It seems we have no choice, Papa replied. Please don't wake my children, Mama requested again. There's no need to frighten the little ones. The heavy booted feet moved across the floor again into the other bedroom. A closet door opened and closed with a bang. Anne Marie eased her bedroom door closed silently. She stumbled through the darkness to the bed. Ellen, she whispered urgently, take your necklace off. Ellen's hands flew around her neck. Desperately, she began trying to unhook the tiny clasp. Outside the bedroom door, the harsh voices and heavy steps continued. I can't open it, Ellen said frantically. I never take it off. I can't even remember how to open it. Anne-Marie heard a voice just outside the door. What is here? Shh, my mother replied, my daughter's bedroom, they are sound asleep. Hold still, Anne-Marie commanded, this will hurt. She grabbed the little gold chain, yanked it with all her strength and broke it. As the door opened, 
and light flooded into the bedroom, she crumpled it into her hand and her fingers closed tightly. Terrified, both girls looked up at three Nazi officers who entered the room. One of the men aimed a flashlight around the bedroom. He went to the closet and looked inside. Then with a sweep of his glove, gloved hand, he pushed to the floor several coats and a bathrobe that hung from pegs on the wall. There was nothing else in the room except a chest of drawers, the blue decorated trunk in the corner and a heap of Kirstie's dolls piled in a small rocking chair. The flashlight beam touched, touched everything in, the, in turn. Angrily, the officer turned toward the bed. Get up, he ordered, come out here. Trembling, the two girls rose from bed and followed him, brushing past the two remaining officers in the doorway to the living room. Anne-Marie looked around. The, these three uniformed men were different from the ones on the street corners. The three soldiers were often young. Street soldiers were often young sometimes, ill at ease, and Anne-Marie remembered how the giraffe had, for a moment, let his harsh poise slip and he smiled at Kirsty. But these men were older and their faces were set with anger. Her parents were standing beside each other, their faces tense, but Kirsty was nowhere in sight. Thank goodness that Kirsty slept through almost everything. If they had wakened her, she would be wailing or worse, she would be angry and her fists would fly. Your names? The officer barked, Anne-Marie Johansson, and this is my sister, quiet, let her speak for yourself. Your name, he was glaring at Ellen. Anne-Marie, swal Ellen swallowed. Lise, she said and cleared her throat. <clears throat> Lise Johansson. The officer stared at them grimly. Now, Mama said in a strong voice, you have seen that we are not hiding anything. May my children go back to bed? The officer ignored her. Suddenly, he grabbed a handful of Ellen's hair. Ellen winced. He laughed scornfully. You have a blonde child sleeping in the other room, and you have this blonde daughter. He gestured toward Anne Marie's head. Where did you get the dark haired one? He twisted the lock of Ellen's hair from a different father, from the milkman. Father stepped forward. Don't speak to my wife in such a way. Let go of my daughter or I will report you for such treatment. Or maybe someplace else, the officer continued with a sneer. From the Rosens? For a moment, no one spoke. Then Anne-Marie watching in panic, saw her father move swiftly to the small bookcase and take out a book. He, she saw that he was holding the family photograph album. Very quickly, he searched through its pages, found what he was looking for, and tore out three pictures from three separate pages. He handed them to the German officer who released Ellen's hair. You will see each of my daughters, each with her name written on the photograph, Papa said. Anne-Marie knew instantly which photographs he had chosen. The album had many snapshots, all the poorly focused pictures of school events and birthday parties, but also, but it also contained a portrait taken by a photographer of each girl as a tiny infant. Mama had written in her delicate handwriting the name of each baby daughter across the bottom of each of those photographs. She realized too, with an icy feeling, why Papa had torn them from the book. At the bottom of each page, below the photograph itself, was written the date. And the real Lise Johansson had been born 21 years earlier. Kirsten Elizabeth, the officer read, looking at Kirsty's baby picture, and let the photograph fall to the floor. Anne Marie, he read, next glanced at her and dropped the second photograph lise margaret he read finally and stared at ellen for a long 
unwavering moment. In her mind, Anne-Marie pictured the photograph that he held, the baby, wide-eyed, propped against a pillow, her tiny hand holding a silver teething ring, her bare feet visible below the hem of an embroidered dress, the wispy curls, dark. The officer tore the photograph in half, dropped the pieces on the floor. Then he turned the, he turned the heels of his shiny boots grinding into the pictures and left the apartment. Without a word, the other two officers followed. Papa stepped forward and closed the door behind them. Anne-Marie relaxed the clenched fingers of her right hand, which still clutched Ellen's necklace. She looked down and saw that she had imprinted the Star of David into her palm. Okay, fourth graders, I would like to remind you that sometimes when you're reading um, certain passages of a book, there are parts of it that seem to be written in bold, metaphorically, not actually in bold, but it seems to be written in bold. And you're, you're pausing and you're thinking, what is this really about? What are they really getting at in this part of the story? So it's important to pay attention to the small details that will lend to the big ideas in the text. So remember that we are thinking deeply about important passages in a book. We're supposed to see what is significant about this part of the story. How does this part fit in with an earlier part? Why might the author have written in this particular way, including these details, these words? Or what is the character learning about life? the world? What are you learning? What are you getting from this particular part of the story?